Hey, what's up, everybody? I hope that you had a lovely weekend and that you are feeling rested and ready to get back into it. We're going to get started right away. We're dealing with classic and contemporary theories of development. And today we'll focus on some of the classic theories, beginning with the stages of growth theory. And if you've done the reading, you may have noticed that it's, um, you know, very uh, technical in some respects and parts of it, if not much of it, don't discuss the role of government or politics or the political structures and institutions that we discussed last week. That was partly by design because today, in addition to introducing these theories, we're also going to try to think about their application and then think about some of those political forces that we talked about last week and think about how we can combine them and synthesize them in a useful way, in a, in a way that would be consistent with our political economy focus in this class. And so we'll do all of this by assessing the case of China, which is obviously extraordinarily important and useful and instructive. But I think we'll also see that its experience doesn't necessarily uh, completely meet our expectations in terms of what we go into the case with after learning about the, the stages of growth theory. Just a moment, my, my cat is just out of control. What is the problem, baby? Come on. We have cabin fever today because it's really uh, cold outside and we, we're having like a blizzard. So, you know, we're all a little cooped up, but we'll talk about China and we'll apply some of these theories and we'll talk about politics and political economy. And we'll learn about these, these theories and how useful they can be and how they align or don't align with, with the cases that we'll study in the class and, and learn about and, and use for our purposes. So let's go ahead and Okay, so we're gonna deal with four theories of development or approaches to development, three sets of perspectives more accurately, all of which have different ideas about what accounts for variation in the indicators and the outcomes that we talked about last week, specifically economic and social development. Now, some of these don't have much to say about political development, but all of them have implications that we can use to, to think about what they might say about political development. Many of them do, but more generally, these are useful perspectives for thinking about what would account for the variation that we observed last week and that we've seen in the patterns that we've talked about so far in the country experiences. The first one that we'll deal with is the linear stages of growth theory developed by this economist Rosto, who was a economist and right wing um, sort of public official who worked in the Kennedy and the LBJ administrations. This is a product of the Cold War era. And in particular, it, it was published in his book from 1960. And the main idea of the theory was that the shift from underdevelopment to development is understood and can be described in terms of a series of stages that all countries must proceed. Rasto was sort of rigid in his assessment of the development experience. And he said that all countries have to proceed through this these set of stages and they have this internal logic, which means that the sequence of stages cannot be uh, changed or altered in that moreover, you can expect 
forward progress in no backsliding in terms of the kind of advance from one stage to another. And in general, Rosto envisioned there being an important role for uh, obviously investment and change within the economy, but also institutional and social and even political innovations and reforms that would kind of create a more modern, uh, but a more, I think in his view, a more open and competitive uh, system or social system that would be supportive of long-term economic growth. And so the stages of growth in Rosto's theory are as follows. You know, you begin at stage one, which is a traditional society. Remember that Rosto said that all societies go through these stages and that in that regard, they all have a common experience. It's just that some societies are at further along than others, later stages than others and, and, and so on. And so this first stage is the stage of a traditional society where there's limited technology and there's limited change and there's very limited activity, low productivity, oftentimes uh, exclusively agricultural economic activity, very primitive uh, means of agricultural production, oftentimes entirely dependent on uh, the seasons and so on and so forth. In general, this is a kind of hyper primitive traditional society that's not capable of producing great wealth or income. Uh, it's possibly capable of, of producing subsistence, but even then it might often be subject to, to changes in weather conditions or crises that, that, um, that interrupt the model, so to speak. But at some stage, at some point, there's some sort of external or internal change or trigger, either markets or the kind of emergence of, of market activity or exchange. Maybe there's interest in commercial expansion or income generation. Maybe there's some sort of external uh, influence or external actor um, that intervenes in some way to introduce some influence that triggers this, this sort of initial takeoff to this preconditioned stage where there's the emergence of commercial agriculture and exploitation of sort of early initial extractive natural resource based industries, oftentimes um, just the export or the, 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 the production of natural resources, be whatever it is that they have abundantly available. But the key difference between this second stage and the first stage is that there's the commercial exploitation, the, ex the exploitation for profit uh, and for the express purpose of generating income or generating wealth and accumulating wealth through this early commercial agriculture, agricultural expansion and extractive and natural resource-based industries. At this stage, there's yet another new sort of phase or an, a new stage or new diversion that involves the installation of physical infrastructure like roads and railways, means of communication. And along with it, there's the emergence of a social and a political elite, um, a group of, of figures with the capacity and the expertise uh, and the leadership and, the, and the, the aptitude to emerge and to sort of take the mantle, so to speak, and organize and facilitate further takeoffs and further development. At this point, this coalescing of a social and political elite in the emergence of these new infrastructure and roads and railways and means of communication, they come together to, to form the foundation for the development of a manufacturing sector. They can produce finished goods and take inputs and commodities and basic resources and those primitive items at this stage and, and produce more finished items and more finished goods. And as the manufacturing sector develops and begins to appear more and more robust, there's um, a concerted effort or intervention by the state that takes the form of an investment that exceeds 10% of national income. Now, I don't know if Rostow would insist that there's a role for the state in this regard, 
but his view is that at this stage of development, there needs to be a concerted investment in manufacturing that exceeds 10% of national income. And so there must be a sort of startup in load, right? You kind of uh, actively invest a larger and larger proportion of national income into manufacturing. Now governments can stimulate and promote that process, but I think theoretically, and in, in, of course in practice, the private sector can as well, in pursuit of higher and higher profits, of course, in pursuit of, of more and more commercial activity. But this investment of 10% or more of national income coincides with the development and consolidation of very modern social, economic, and political institutions, including, of course, the market and property rights and civil liberties and rights, but also democratic elections. I think that in Rosto's vision, uh, there's really a, a place exclusively for, uh, for democratic and competitive and open and liberal forms of, of, of of, of government in, in organizing political activity and social and economic activity. Now, of course, it's understood sort of implicitly or, or explicitly that these institutions support the continued promotion and, and development of, of forms of generating income and accumulating wealth. And this drive to maturity that follows the subsequent stage is this sort of exponential growth and further growth of the industrial and commercial base that was that originated in these earlier stages. And at this point in time, there's this sort of refinement and consolidation where there's this active and more exclusive focus on the comparative advantages. That is the things that the country can produce most efficiently or with the, the, the lowest sort of input and most productively and, and, and fetch the highest profit. And this exploitation of comparative advantages and in international trade that follows facilitates and fosters more generally this final stage, which is high mass consumption. And this is a stage characterized by the emergence and the sort of flourishing of uh, a large middle class and social classes capable of consuming more and more and more and driving further and further growth and sustaining continued growth uh, through the future. And Rosto's stages of growth are understood as very linear and this process is quite deterministic in the sense that not only is it linear, but it's understood as, as generating sufficient momentum to always carry forward to the next stage. The, the prospect of backsliding or underdevelopment or dedevelopment, um, it doesn't, doesn't fit neatly with this, this, this vision of growth and this vision of development. And this is a theory, of course, and it's a simplification of reality. And it's a, a model that captures and, and works with a number of expectations about how institutions, social, political, and economic complement each other to promote or inhibit growth and how certain kinds of institutions should emerge at certain points in time as a result of development or growth at earlier stages. And so in, in some respects, interestingly, curiously, though Rosto was himself quite right wing, this deterministic linear view of, of social and economic and political development is very similar to the, to the, to the view expounded by, by Karl Marx, who thought that there was also a sort of rhythm and continuity in linear development to human history in that eventually there would, there would be this um, uh, ultimate outcome that would, that would involve, of course, communism in the eradication of the state and the elimination of market relationships and the replacement with, with something um, communitarian. That, of course, we think of very differently than this, which obviously plays more with the idea of free markets and comparative advantages in, in, in free markets. But that linear view of development is, is nevertheless very much here as well. And so this is an interesting way of thinking about development. And what I'd like to suggest is that we can take this lens and we can think about its application and relevance in the case of China, which of course is a extraordinarily important case and is one that grew very rapidly in a period of about 30 years. Many say that they accomplished in 30 years what European and, and Western and, and Northern countries 
took centuries to accomplish. And that's arguably true. Although critics would, would say that there's a, a load of debt and, and a lot of pollution in the costs that came with it that, that might eradicate and erase some of those gains. Nevertheless, I think that we can use the lens very usefully here to think about China. And so I want you to think about those stages of growth. Think about that refinement of social and political and economic institutions, commercial expansion, the development of a, of a manufacturing base, comparative advantages, consumption, and ultimately sort of self-sustaining growth. Um, think about that as we watch this video, and then we'll return here in a moment and um, think about its relevance and, and evaluate how well it fits. Chinese history for the past 30 years has been a story of economic growth. There's never really been an economic revolution quite like China's. You know, the most populous country in the world also enjoying the most rapid economic growth in history. An industrial revolution is far more rapid than in Britain or America, for example. We've never seen so many people come out of poverty so quickly. We've never seen so many people go from the rural countryside into the city so quickly. What it took Europe 150 years to do in the Industrial Revolution, China has done in 30 years. In 1979, Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping called on the country to combine socialist ideology with elements of a pragmatic market economy under the banner of socialism with Chinese characteristics, reportedly telling the Chinese people to get rich is glorious. After Mao died and Deng Xiaoping rose to power, that was one of the great events, I think, of the 20th century. What he did was, if you will, decommunize or decentralize much of the economy of China. There's some economists who think that this year, China's going to contribute more real GDP growth to the global economy than the US, Europe, and Japan combined. We can think of China as a one big factory, and this factory has to keep churning in order to keep up the economic growth. There's still a lot of unlocked resources or idle resources. But in recent years, growth has begun to slow. The double-digit GDP growth that we saw in the 1990s and the early 2000s was an exceptional era. It will never be repeated again because that was this extraordinary export-led economy matched by a demographic dividend of very low young age, moving up to a middle-aged working population. Annual growth rates some um, 10 years ago, 9, 10, 11 percent, now about 6.5 percent. The question is, what's the reason for the slowdown compared with earlier growth rates? I think it's just natural. Even though there is a headline growth slowdown, China's economy is still growing at a much bigger rate than it uh, has before in terms of real output, just because it's so much bigger now. It is a function of the need to rein in some of the economic development channels that were getting out of control. China has severe air pollution issues, environmental degradation that pervades almost every corner of the country. That's a function of unbridled economic development. Beijing now wants to shift away from manufacturing towards a service-oriented economy. It initially was focusing on manufacturing. It also focused on trying to bring in foreign companies who would use China's low-cost labor along the coastline and assemble things for export. But as it's developed, and as they've realized there's a need to start transitioning their economy into something more sustainable, they realize they have to build up its services. And that is hard. You have to do it in a way that's sustainable, that creates as few social dislocations as possible. Uh, while at the same time delivering for people on a certain level of economic growth to which they've been accustomed. What you see in their data is the service sector is growing rapidly, consumption is growing rapidly. That's great. You know, I was just in China. Young people are out in restaurants and cafes and they're buying cars. Chinese consumption as a portion of China's GDP has certainly grown. And that transition is happening. But interestingly, the roads are still being built. The high-speed rails are still being built. And this investment-led system is, is kind of still moving on. Not at the same pace as it was, say, 10 years ago. But I would argue it hasn't slowed enough to bolster the meaningful transition to a consumer-based economy. <laughs> 
We'll watch one more. China's economy is a bit like a hybrid car. It has two types of engine to drive it forward. The biggest, most powerful engine is the one that has propelled the world's second largest economy forward at impressive speed over the past three decades. It derives its thrust from investment in infrastructure, real estate and factories. The other engine relies on a smaller, newer dynamo, that of consumer spending and services. Beijing's overarching policy of rebalancing prioritizes a shift in reliance from the old engine to the newer one. In other words, prioritizing consumer spending over investment. However, headline statistics published on Friday reveal a step backwards in the rebalancing efforts. China has clearly decided to engage its bigger, older engine as part of a strategy to prioritize rapid growth over rebalancing. In real terms, GDP growth in the first quarter of this year rose 6.7%, easing slightly from the 6.8% level seen in the fourth quarter of last year. But the key insight behind the numbers is that although GDP growth remained robust, much of the impetus behind it came from China's old economy engines. Fixed asset investment in infrastructure, factories, real estate, etc., showed a strong pickup in March to 10.7%, its strongest growth since August last year. Investment in real estate showed particular strength, as did government spending on building more transport infrastructure, water conservation, and environmental management systems. By contrast, some of the newer engines slowed somewhat. For instance, service industries grew by 7.6% in the first quarter, down from 8.3% in the last quarter of 2016. All this means that while expectations have strengthened that the Chinese economy may meet its growth target this year, concerns among analysts over the sustainability of growth have also deepened. They say that Beijing cannot hope to rely indefinitely on debt financed investment in an already frothy real estate market and traditional heavy industries that have already been riven by overcapacity. Now it's worth remembering that when we talk about investment in the Chinese economy, in, in particular the choices made domestically, those are primarily choices made by the state. The largest companies in China are still state owned and those are deliberate policy choices about investment when we're talking about trade-offs between rebalancing or consumer driven uh, growth versus investments in factories uh, in the expansion of, of manufacturing. So there's an important role for, of course, the government, but the economy itself also incorporates and includes all sorts of private actors and, and foreign actors as well. And so the story of China includes all of those players and the investments in the policies that we talk about are principally made by the state. Now, I'd like us to pause here and use the case of China to reflect on the stages of growth theory and to think about how well the theory applies in this case. And my question for you, and I'd like us to just pause for a moment as we think about this and before we discuss this and address this is does stages of growth theory provide a good explanation of the development situation in China? Why or why not? Does that set of stages and those phases, do they map closely to the development situation in the development of China? Are there deviations? Does China appear to be unique in some ways or different than what the, stage of, the stages of growth theory anticipates. 
what is unique about the Chinese case, if it is unique or if it is different? In what ways does it map closely to the, to the trajectory and, and so on and so forth? And so let's just pause for a moment and I wanna give you a chance to think about this. So in what ways does stages of growth theory provide a good explanation of the development situation in China? So what are the strengths of this theory when applied to the Chinese case? Okay, Victor, so Victor says the takeoff stage helps to explain China's robust growth. Victor, do you mean in particular the large proportion of national income that was invested in fixed capital assets like factories and manufacturing facilities? Is that what you're referring to? Absolutely. Yeah, so there certainly was an important role for a takeoff stage, right? Remember the takeoff stages incorporate or involve more than 10% of national income being invested in factories. And what's interesting about Rosto's theory is you think about how concerted that choice has to be. That doesn't just happen, right? That's a choice made by society, but who's making the choice? Typically, there's an important role for the government or for the state, you know, in the East Asian economies that grew before China, like South Korea and Japan, those actors typically were technocrats who were in specific agencies charged with making decisions about investment targets and production targets and facilitating cooperation between firms timing and sequencing the lifting of trade barriers. These are choices that are made by someone and ordinarily in, in East Asia, historically, these choices have been made by the state. And of course the state, when it begins as a closed economy is also the one who makes decisions about the timing of liberalization, when or how to privatize industries, under what circumstances and when to permit investment by foreign capital. These are choices made by the state. What else does the stages of growth theory explain about China? Um, or alternatively, are there things about the Chinese case that stages of growth theory cannot explain? Victor, what do you mean when you say China's growth didn't seem linear? Can you explain that? And I'd like to hear from as many people as possible. Are there others out there who'd like to comment just in general about whether stages of growth theory seems like a good explanation uh, of the development situation in China? So it maybe slowed down. Um, and so maybe in that respect, it didn't, it didn't, 
meet expectations or maybe the expectations were unrealistic is one economist in the video said that seems like a natural graduation to a, just a slower rate of development a slower rate of growth in general do you think that this is a persuasive explanation of the chinese case or are there aspects of the china story that uh, that don't fit neatly with stages of growth theory Um, I don't know. Can you hear me, Professor? Yes, I can, Matt. Okay. I think generally it provides a good outline of uh, the stages that uh, the People's Republic went through when developing. Um, although it definitely blasted through some of the stages. Um, however, I, I, I think when we talk about the, uh, the neoliberal perspective later, I think that could be applied to China with uh, with a little more resonance that this theory can't quite reach. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point because one thing that doesn't fit neatly with the theory is the political reality of Chinese development. It's taken place under an authoritarian regime and Rosto, um, thought that innovations in political institutions and you know the modernization of, of political institutions would support and was ultimately important to the to the growth and the takeoff and the sustained development that would result from his his stages of of growth and so in that regard the chinese case does not fit neatly at all however interestingly as matt points out or or maybe suggests here the neoliberal perspective doesn't really have that requirement. In fact, in, in some ways, from the beginning, it was understood that the radical reforms that neoliberalism required would often flourish better under authoritarian governments precisely because they could act more decisively and without regard for electoral incentives, um, you know, or the concern that would come from uh, not surviving the next election. And so, the political reality is actually a missing piece here. And, and this is important because of course, this is a course on political economy and economic development does not take place in a vacuum. It actually does take place in a institutional context that's set up and refereed by and supported and altered and changed by, by political forces. And so Miguel says, if I remember correctly, I also believe that high mass consumption was also a big factor of the stages that China had so far they talked about. They were looking at the interests of the consumers. So there is, certainly is a role for high mass consumption, but interestingly, the, the second video as well as the first highlighted that there's sort of this toggling back and forth between investment in factories in manufacturing and investment in services and consumption driven industries. And it's that decision and that trade-off between rapid growth, which is often driven by investment in fixed capital assets like factories and more consumption driven growth, which is in, uh, stimulated by investment in services. That's a trade-off. That's a trade-off that decision makers frequently reckon with and they have to choose between those, those two alternatives and in the, case of China, that's been a, a trade-off. But of course, Rosto expects that this linear process should ultimately really very smoothly transition from manufacturing to services and that there shouldn't be that kind of, that kind of wavering. But I think that ultimately Rosto's model doesn't capture that wavering because it doesn't really attend to the role of politics and the political considerations that sometimes come. You know, why would it be that the Communist Party and the Communist state in China favors rapid growth and rapid development through investment in fixed assets like factories versus the slower growth that might come from investment in services and consumption? Well, could it be that they're themselves dealing with 
um, an increasingly literate and well-organized society and, and well-educated society that is increasingly calling for uh, or wanting some sort of political liberalization that would that would accommodate and be consistent with the economic gains that the country has made. You know, what kinds of political considerations might motivate one choice over, over the other? I don't think that those choices are captured at all by Rostow's model. I think I'm actually getting ahead of myself here though, because I wanted to see what you all thought about, about that here in a moment, which I will. Can I add another thing, Professor? Yes, ma'am. I think uh, just the, the scale of China as a country comes into play here too with this, with this model not being that effective. Um, because as, as we know, China is a giant country. It's the largest by population. It's the largest in the world. And by you know land area, it's one of the largest in the world. So there's a lot of, uh, I'd call it diversity between development levels ac across different parts of the country. So if you go to Shanghai, it's a completely developed, uh, wealthy uh, city and surrounding area, uh, as opposed to many parts of the country and still hundreds of millions of people in China are living uh, you know, in the same levels of poverty that they lived in before um, the uh, 1970s. So there's a, a question about the distribution of income and whether all boats have been lifted. I think that we could say that Brasto's model doesn't actually account for that question of the distribution of income. When we talk about manufacturing and economic development, that's more in line with those earlier notions of development. Remember that conceived of development as purely economic and really relating mainly to total output, not even to levels of income per person. And so Rostow, of course, generated this theory, this model in 1960. And so that was a period that came well before the new focus on the distribution of income and the more holistic in indicators that include social and, and, and political development. So. The question of the distribution of income matters in, in China too, because even though there's been an enormous increase in the size of the middle class and there's been a shift in, in, in the concentration of population from the countryside to the cities, the gains still haven't been shared equally and, and questions about the distribution of income do become important and, and maybe that matters a lot to this story too. It also says the linear stages of growth assumed homogeneity of, of growth implementation across the country. Yeah, that clearly doesn't apply here. And some of those assum assumptions are unrealistic. And when, when we smuggle in those assumptions from economics, we don't consider questions that often matter more to us in politics about the distribution or the, the sharing of those gains. And distributive politics becomes a consideration as well as the, dis the distribution of the population itself. and and of course, you, we hear stories too about, and it's not just stories, this is a reality. There are huge cities that sit empty that have been, that have been built by the state in China and that they anticipate can absorb some of the population from the countryside, but that still hasn't taken place, that shift in many cases. Although that does testify to the role of the state in investing in these kinds of uh, infrastructure that, that were mentioned both in the stages of growth theory and in the video. Christiana says, could it also relate to China being communist and how when governments switch, how they rule, it can, it can negatively affect the economy? Well, I think that the question of how well they perform economically in terms of, of policy, that's sort of what we're evaluating. And there may be some real questions about the negative consequences of policymaking under authoritarian governments, even when they can promote economic development. And one question might be corruption. And in China, eradicating corruption has been a challenge because under authoritarian rules, corruption often flourishes much more than under democratic rules. And I think the question of their, their economic policy though is what we're evaluating here and how well they've done. And that actually gets to a question that I wanted to post to you next and that relates closely to this discussion it helps us begin to 
really evaluate and maybe critique Rostow's theory. And the question is, what role did political actors, political institutions, and public policies play in supporting or inhibiting China's move from one stage of growth to the next? And I'll just be kind of begin this discussion myself, and I'd like you to kind of think about this as well. This is the piece that is so often missing in economic models, which often treat development as a process that kind of takes place in a vacuum, even if policy is part of the model itself. It's almost as if the choices involved just completely fall by the wayside. Think about the beginning of this process. It goes back to 1978 when there was a deliberate choice by the Chinese leader at the time to initiate a process of economic liberalization that specifically would involve lowering some of the constraints on, on foreign investment, on private ownership of, of enterprise. Gradually, China began to liberalize its economy and allow for private initiative and private entrepreneurship and private investment and private ownership foreign investment and foreign ownership. Gradually, the Chinese state began to promote these sorts of outcomes as well through policies designed to attract foreign investment, through policies designed to stimulate and initiate and bolster and support and really even ease private initiative, often through tax abatements, special economic zones, often designed for manufacturing of garments by foreign capital owners and companies that were producing goods and garments that would be shipped to foreign markets and then sold in, in the United States or Europe or elsewhere. All of these are political decisions in political institutions and structures and policies that went with this story of, of growth and development in China and they made it possible to promote development and growth in China. And in many ways they supported and fostered and catalyzed that growth. It's not possible, frankly, to imagine development in China without going to 1978 when there was a deliberate policy choice made to sort of unshackle and free the markets and open up initiative and open up investment to, to foreigners and to, to private actors and to begin to sell state enterprises and to begin to liberalize the economy. Uh, these are all examples of, of the political forces and the, the policy choices that supported and, and catalyzed and fostered this development process. And you can even see how choices made by the, the communist government helped to sort of send China to earlier stages. Remember how there were choices made to reinvest more deeply in factories and manufacturing and sort of de-invest in some sense in services in the ways that maybe some political considerations might have motivated the choice to, to double down on earlier advantages in, in, in manufacturing and move away from services and, con and consumption driven investments. These are all examples in, in, in ways that politics become relevant to the Chinese case. And I would even venture to say that some of the rapid growth in China uh, was possible because of how decisive decision-making was under authoritarian institutions and one party rule and sustained one party rule and one party rule that involved parallelism and the formation of organizations that paralleled the state and that permitted the, the Communist Party to establish and maintain very tight control of, of policymaking and to share power within it as, a, as, the, as the key sole institution and power broker in China. When you put all of this together, the development experience in China, it cannot be separated from politics. In fact, I would venture to say that politics made development in China possible. Politics in some sense got China into development and in politics may get it out if it's ever the case that China begins to de-develop like we saw for instance in Argentina uh, in the 20th century. But I wanna pump the brakes and slow down here 
and ask you, you know, what role did political actors or political institutions or public policies play in supporting or inhibiting China's move from one stage of growth to the next? Was there anything that I didn't get or capture in my discussion just a moment ago? What else is there to this story of the politics of development in China? I think in order to talk about the growth and rise of China's economy, you have to talk about the United States as well. Because yes, first and foremost, it was the Chinese leaders decision to liberalize their markets that led to this economic revolution of sorts. But also it was, you know, the political uh, motives of the United States and the Nixon reg uh, administration to attempt to crack open the largest market on the planet and, uh, you know, break the break down or create a larger divide between the Soviet Union and China, the two largest communist countries during the Cold War. So it was, you know, the United States helping China along with this process and providing endless amounts of capital to help initiate the growth in China. So the interests of the United States, obviously relevant. It's not just domestic politics and domestic interests that affect these things. Clearly, there was a role for uh, foreign influence peddlers and actors who took it upon themselves to make it a project to crack that nut open, as you put it, Matt. And I think that that's really relevant to this story because nothing happens in a vacuum. And it was the largest market and it did represent those enormous possibilities and I'll go further and say that China's growth has been bolstered and, and made possible by its access to natural resources and commodities and, and huge volumes from markets in, in Latin America where it can buy them at a relatively good rate because it's such a huge purchaser uh, of those commodities and, and where it's established close working relationships as a result of the liberalization of its markets and in the lowering of tariffs. All of these factors paint a picture that it's undeniable. China doesn't exist on its own. There are foreign as well as domestic interests. There are political as well as economic interests and policies and actors and institutions all supported this move from one stage to another it's more difficult to imagine what sorts of circumstances may have inhibited China's movement from one stage to another. And it's sometimes hard to see how China might have grown more quickly or more rapidly, but it might be worth saying that as the video pointed out, the deliberate policy choice of sort of reinvesting in manufacturing and moving away from service-driven and consumption-driven investments that appears to maybe be uh, an, in, an inhibitor of that movement from, from those latter stages to that final stage of sustained consumption. If there's a, an inhibitor in, in some sense, that might be one. And that is an example of a policy choice, a deliberate policy choice that might have a short-term gain in the form of rapid growth in the short term, but might inhibit China's movement to that ultimate stage of sustained consumption. But that is, of course, political. And so shedding light on the politics of this is really that component that Brasto doesn't seem to pay as much attention to. And that brings me to my final question. And the question is, is Rosto's stages of growth theory able to incorporate these political variables into its framework? Why or why not? Um, is it sufficiently open to these kinds of political variables? Or does it appear closed to, to the incorporation of say, you know, the type of regime uh, or the type of policy program or the kinds of actors or leadership or interests or the configuration of domestic and foreign uh, interests involved in, in promoting certain kinds of policy choices? The question is an interesting one because it makes us think about whether there's any room at all 
for adjusting the model when it's so deterministic and linear uh, in its sequencing and, and in the continuity that it assigns to the development and the growth of any given social system. But it's a question that's important for us because again, we focus on the political economy of these issues and, and that begs the question of the role of politics and whether there's sufficient space for politics and for political forces for in these theories. And in Rostow's stages of growth theory is the first and foremost of these classic theories that we'll consider. It did form the basis for our, our lecture and discussion today, but we will get into subsequent theories and models, uh, including not just neoliberalism, but also dependency theory and um, also the structural change models that, that came after the stages of growth theory. We'll cover those on Wednesday and Friday and um, we'll also cover some contemporary theories as well. But thank you very much, everyone, for being here. Excuse me, I can't talk today. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here. And um, I'll see you on Wednesday.